quarter. It is 6.08 p.m. And I'd like to read an opening statement. <clears throat> Welcome to the January 12th, 2021 electronic meeting of the Energy Commission. This virtual meeting is to affect social distancing and to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. We intend to conduct this meeting similar to in-person meetings. Commissioners, please remain on camera just as you would be visible during in-person meetings. Also mute your microphone when not speaking. Public comment will be via telephone only. To speak during any of the public comment opportunities, please call one of the following toll-free numbers, 888-788-0099. Or 877 853 5247 and enter the meeting ID 913 5783 4502. That's 913 5783 4502. These numbers will remain <clears throat> the same during the entire year for Energy Commission meetings. This information, along with the two local dial-in numbers, is also available on the published agenda in the public meeting notice section of the city website, on the broadcast of this meeting on CTN channel 16, AT&T channel 99, and online at www.a2gov.org slash backslash watch CTN. So, um, Next, I'd like um, to move to the land acknowledgement. And Missy, would you please read the land acknowledgement statement? Thank you, Chair Mirsky. I acknowledge that the land the city of Ann Arbor occupies is the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe, including the Ottawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi, and Wyandotte peoples. I further acknowledge that our city stands, like almost all property in the United States, on lands obtained generally in unconscionable ways from indigenous peoples. The taking of this land was formalized by the Treaty of Detroit in 1807. Knowing where we live, work, study, and recreate does not change the past, but a thorough understanding of the ongoing consequences of this past can empower us in our work to create a future that supports human flourishing and justice for all individuals. Thank you. Um, Missy, would you also lead um, the roll call, please? Uh, Commissioner Hookham. Commissioner McComber. You, on mute, but here, yes. Uh, Commissioner Schreiber. Here. Commissioner Cleavy. Here. Commissioner Levin. Chair Mirsky. Present. Co-Chair Colvin Garcia. Here. Councilmember Briggs. Here. Councilmember Radina. Here. Uh, Commissioner Zucker. Here. Commissioner Hatcher. Present. Commissioner McCoy. Here. Commissioner Jorg. Here. Commissioner Singleton. Here. Great. Commissioner Kerber. I think we have a quorum. Yep, I'm, I'm here. Yeah. I will be here until about 7.30. I've got um, another obligation. Thanks, Larry. Appreciate mm -hmm. you being able to join us for as long as you can. Um, so, um, first of all, um, I'd like um, everyone to take a look at the agenda. And um, if um, one of you would make a motion um, to approve the agenda, I would appreciate that. I move that we approve the agenda. Do we have a second? Second. Do we have any discussion? If not, um, all of those are in favor of approving the agenda, please um, raise your hand. And if you can, also indicate verbally that you approve it. So approve. 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 <laughs> approve. Great. Looks like we have unanimous approval. Um, next. Um, we have approval of the minutes. Um, the minutes were loaded um, um, late this afternoon onto Legistar. Um, I don't know if everybody's had a chance to look at those. Um, 
we could um, either approve them now or we could potentially, if people have not had a chance to look at them, um, delay that to the next meeting. I don't think that would be a problem. Um, do we have a, an approval to, uh, I mean, a motion to approve? We could then have a discussion on whether we take a final vote now after some discussion. Do we have a motion by anybody? I have a motion from Council Member Briggs, second from anyone, and second from Council Member Regina. Um, has everybody had a chance to review the minutes? Um, would people like to vote on them or would they like to postpone that to the next meeting? Did people get a chance to look at them? I think it was sent out also via email, but it went out rather late, um, I think. I have not had a chance to review them. I don't know about the other commissioners. Yeah, I haven't seen them. To be yet. honest with you, I, I haven't either, too. So I don't see them on Legistar yet either, unless I'm not looking in the right place. So I just oh, okay. Moved well, yeah, I was going to say I didn't think I saw an email with the minutes. But yeah, I didn't minutes. get it. Me okay. neither. Okay, I, I communicated with Josh this afternoon. He was going to try to get them on Legistar, and I thought that he said he had. But um, why don't we postpone that to the next meeting? I think it's generally a formality, anyhow. But at least this way, we're um, doing it the right way. So. Um, I sorry, sorry to interrupt. Please. Yeah. I also did. I don't see an agenda anywhere. Is that sent to us, or do we have to go to Legislar to get that? It's in Legislar. So if you go to the city calendar and call up the Energy Commission meeting, you'll you'll find the agenda there, as well as um, in the agenda are links to all of the presentations that we'll see this afternoon or this evening. We also got an email from Josh with the agenda. Okay. Okay. So um, while you guys are checking on that, if you want to, I'm going to move ahead to the next point on the agenda, which is public input. And I have a statement to read there too. This is an opportunity for persons to speak for up to three minutes. If you're watching on CTN and you're not already dialed in, please call um, one of the two following numbers. 888-788-0099 or 887-853-5247 and enter the meeting ID, it's the same number as before, 913-5783-4502. This information is also on display in the meeting agenda and the video feed. C city staff, will select callers that have raised their hand one by one using the last three digits of your phone number. In order to electronically raise your hand, indicate your, to dis, indicate your desire to speak, please press star nine on your phone. You will hear an automated announcement that the host is allowing you to speak. When speaking, please move to a quiet area and mute any television or background sounds so that we may hear you and please state your name and address at the beginning of your comments. Missy, I think you're the one monitoring, correct? Yes, yeah, so far we have two folks who've called in, but no one has raised their hand yet. Okay, we'll give them 30 seconds or so. Chair, you still have, uh, no one has indicated. A Why don't we move on? We have a chance again later, and if need be after the, uh, maybe the energy oh. report. I have uh, since changed uh, caller last digits, one, three, four. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay. Caller one, three, four, you are, um, we can hear you. Thank you very much, Dr. Stoltz and Chair Mursky. This is Ken Garber, 28 Haverhill Court. Uh, I have for you a three-minute update on fossil fuels in new construction. Okay, burning natural gas in buildings in 2019 generated 580,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent greenhouse gases, or 32% of the city's total emissions. Strategy two, action one of the 820 carbon neutrality plan includes the following assumption, quote, all new residential and commercial buildings are designed and built to operate without the use of natural gas, reducing the increased costs associated with retrofitting existing systems, end quote. This is critical because new buildings that burn fossil fuels 
we'll be pumping out greenhouse gases through the end of the century or longer. It's telling that restricting natural gas for space heating is one of two elements of the A20 plan that DTE Energy objects to. The other is electric market deregulation. Luckily for DTE, we have no way of enforcing either yet. Exactly one year ago, before the A20 plan came out, I submitted to Energy Commission a draft city ordinance banning natural gas in new construction. About a dozen cities around the country, most recently San Francisco, have passed such mandatory building electrification ordinances. Mine incorporated what I thought were the best features of several existing laws. Nothing happened. At a council member's request, the city attorney's office issued a confidential opinion that such an ordinance would be illegal under state law. I cannot see this memo, but it almost certainly cites a Michigan law known as the Still DeRosset Hale Single State Construction Code Act, or PA 230, which supposedly prevents cities from passing their own building codes for new construction because the state code sets a uniform standard. However, I now know that law intimately and there's nothing in it that says that cities cannot pass stricter building codes than the state code. I even contacted the bill's author, former Republican State Senator Leon Still. Still wrote back that his law sets a minimum standard only and that cities can pass stricter building codes if they see fit. So the city attorney's legal opinion could be wrong and should be reevaluated. It's painful every time city council approves a new project that burns natural gas because we're locking in decades of emissions. The planning commission to its great credit is taking on this issue. And with some, thank you, and with some success, a large apartment project near Pioneer High School, Valhalla Glen switched from gas to electric when asked and the smaller near North Town homes on North Main looks like it'll do the same. Two projects, Viridian and County Farm Park and a mixed use project at, on Packard are going all electric on their own initiative. But many developers still refuse to do this. Um, I should note that OSI, I believe, is preparing to push for state adoption of the International Energy Conservation Code's Zero Code Renewable Energy Appendix in the State Energy Code, which is up for revision this year. This would require new buildings to achieve net zero carbon emissions, but I don't know what our chances are. Uh, in summary, we continue to approve new construction with fossil fuel infrastructure, but the Planning Commission is fighting it out project by project. And we're gearing up for a battle to change the state energy code, which may or may not be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garber. Chair Mersky, we have no one else in the queue. Okay. Mersky? Yes. I wonder if it would be appropriate for the Energy Commission to, or at least our council people, to ask the city attorney um, for their opinion on this new information um, and is a reading of his, his uh, review of this law and ruling. We have that at a minimum. I'd like to at least look again and say, no, I was right, and we'll move on. Do we have any th further thoughts from anyone um, present tonight that um, Council Member Briggs? I would say I haven't, I haven't read this, so I will certainly request it. And um, I agree that there's, um, I suspect there's some staff wisdom on this as well as some legal opinions. And it would be nice to have that revisited if it needs to be, or at least shared more publicly as well. Yeah. I am, uh, Mr. Chair. I also support uh, what uh, Commissioner Cleavy said there. Um, I think that is a, a great way that uh, could be done within the current development needs of the city and really does speak, uh, like the caller said, to the needs in the long run, um, you know, especially with new construction. Uh, like he said, the buildings will be in place for decades to come and retrofitting buildings after they've already been built is a very expensive process. So it was, we all know. So I support that wholeheartedly. Very good. Um, I, I just might add, there's been some offline conversations on this topic, and um, maybe um, we can take this up under um, items for um, future agendas um, and talk about um, what might be the appropriate way of handling this um, in um, commission meetings. Um, uh, do we have anyone else? Um, Ms. John, Ms. can you hear me? Yes. 
Sorry, it's Chuck. I'm on the phone. I cannot enter the meeting for some reason. Again, technical difficulties. Um, on the state energy code, I was an intervener the last time the current version was adopted. Um, the Contractors Association and many others fought vehemently that we don't advance the next round of the ICC's latest energy code, energy conservation code forward. Um, same thing with the ASHRAE 90.1. We, we still, as Wayne Mapleyard will attest, are in the dark ages on ASHRAE standards. So there is a need to press forward. I attempted to do this by getting on the code committee. Um, I was not appointed by the governor, but um, there's still avenues. And um, as Mr. Garvey said, we, we should take this up. It's something I've been researching and I think there is an avenue. So let's talk about this and add it to an agenda. This building code issue is critically important to A20. Yeah. Yeah, the current code is um, based on ASHRAE standard 2013 and um, a new standard was updated in 16 and again in 19. So we're two steps behind. So there's definitely a need to, uh, to act on this one way or the other. Um, I think, Missy, that you said that was the last call, correct? Okay, very good. Um, so we're gonna proceed to the next point on the agenda, which is um, the energy report. And then we'll go from there um, after news from the energy office um, and Office of Sustainability and Innovation to any reports from commissioners. Missy? Yeah, so a few things to highlight. Uh, we are launching our next round of SolarEyes events for 2021. We've concluded eight uh, bulk buys, over 850 kilowatts um, of new solar have been installed in the community through that program. We have our first cohort going uh, in end of January and another one following shortly thereafter. So if you're interested or have friends and colleagues you'd like to recruit into the program, please let us know. And of course, with uh, the stimulus package, we have the extension of the ITC credits for two more years. So we'll be having two more years of 26%, which I think is uh, really exciting for us. We were, um, we were a little nervous about what the next year would look like if we were about to sunset those credits. So really excited to see the program continue growing. Um, special thanks to our solar race coordinator, Julie Rock, for the hard work that she's doing. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some, some ways we're trying to branch and grow that program uh, later in the agenda. Also wanted to share, we brought on board Sean Reynolds. He's our 10,000 Trees Initiative coordinator. Um, he is helping us figure out how in A20, um, one of the initiatives is planting 10,000 trees over the next decade. Uh, we brought Sean on to jumpstart that initiative, which was not slated to really begin in earnest until later in the process, but the pandemic uh, really brought this forward. You can invest in trees. It's good for us to be outside. Uh, at this moment, we can socially distance while doing plantings. And so we jumpstarted this initiative and Sean is going to be uh, actively working. He's designing some different programs. He'll be talking to our A20 partners about them, getting some feedback. Uh, he's talking to members of the community now, and hopefully we'll have something to launch in March or April for that initiative, a formal program. So it's really exciting to see that one move a lot of alignment with a number of uh, things we deeply care about here. The EV readiness ordinance, which you guys have been so instrumental in, especially uh, co-chair uh, Colvin Garcia, is going for its second reading on Monday to city council. Um, thank you everyone for the really hard work that you've put into that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about kind of what's next in uh, the end of the session, but that's really exciting. In addition, city council did approve some grant funding that we received and um, I'll approve the allocation of some budget that we have in OSI slated for fast chargers. So we're just waiting now for the ground to thaw and we'll be installing four DCFC chargers at City Hall, which is really exciting. They'll be the first chargers and the fast chargers in the downtown corridor. And then we've been working on an assessment with DDA to really increase the number of level two chargers throughout our infrastructure broadly. Um, and we are looking at a hard pivot now to thinking about uh, low income and uh, how we're gonna expand EV access in that market as well. Uh, sharing, um, uh, apologies if you already know this, we were asked by the McKnight Foundation to submit a small grant, a planning grant in partnership with Community Action Network and Michigan Saves to do a whole home health assessment, indoor comfort assessment designed by residents of a neighborhood with residents of that neighborhood. And we chose the Bryant neighborhood. So we uh, had a meeting with the funder. We have, we'll hear in late February whether or not we've been successful, but they've encouraged us to really start putting 
putting some systems in place to do that work. So the money goes directly to residents in the neighborhood. We'll be uh, hiring someone through CAN uh, that is from the Bryant community to help with that work. And of course, we're working with Michigan Saves and others to design the program. Very exciting stuff. Um, in addition, we are looking to launch a, a sticker campaign and some sort of educational campaign around beneficial electrification. And I'll talk about that again when we get to the kind of ideas for collaboration with OSI. Missy, Our, can you just tell yeah. people what, where the Bryant neighborhood is? I'm betting there are a lot of people that don't, that aren't familiar with it. You know who I would ask to tell us exactly where the Bryant neighborhood is? Our council member, if he would be willing to give us some geographical boundaries to that. Council member Rodina, would you, would you perhaps help us? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. That's my neighborhood. Um, and so, yeah, it is um, just north of Ellsworth, that, that neighborhood that is uh, actually outside of the uh, perimeter of the, the highway um, off of Stone School. Um, the Bryant, Element, Bryant Elementary School and Arbor Oaks Park are here in the neighborhood. And so you, you'll often also hear it called Arbor Oaks. Um, but um, yeah, it is uh, between, I guess, Stone School and the Forest Hills Cooperative. Thank you. Yes, and sorry, I'm looking at my notes, so I did not see that. Please jump in and just tell me to stop any second. So I'm going to wrap this up here with just a few more high level updates for you. Our benchmarking, um, in particular in the commercial space, is going well. The task force meets um, for its kind of final, final ish meeting. Uh, shortly, and then we're going to public comment. So we're actually putting the recommendations together. We anticipate early February, those recommendations will be out. We're going to have some town halls, um, an opportunity to really gather comprehensive feedback. And then we'll reconvene the task force to digest that feedback and craft the final recommendations and then start getting that uh, benchmarking into the ordinance review process, similar to what we did with the EV work. We'll also, uh, our hope is that we present the commercial benchmarking at the same time we present time of marketing. So they'll go as a package since both, both are about disclosure. And then uh, the rental efficiency standards are about performance. And so those will go separately to council. Uh, landfill solar, to give you an update, I'm sure it's been silenced for a while. We are in the second phase of the interconnection study. Our results are due, I believe, February 4th, but don't quote me, it might be plus or minus a few days. Uh, so any day now we could hear results. This is uh, the much deeper clarity in terms of cost to upgrade the system and to actually make the investment on site. Uh, this is a really important part of understanding the viability of the project. <clears throat> and this also intersects with the filing that we did. We intervened in the voluntary green pricing program that DT has. We are in settlement discussions now about that program and the landfill solar program is a part of it. They wrapped it in as a customer offering. And so we are certainly um, discussing opportunities to perhaps, um, if magic happens, uh, to turn it into a community solar uh, pilot. So that's what we're negotiating for. Um, and we'll see, we'll see how that falls out. But that would be a lovely victory since our legislature hasn't been able to move it forward if we can move it through intervention. Um, we're, we're excited about the possibility. And I will say uh, we see glimmers of hope, but we have a lot of work to do yeah. before we land on that. And then lastly, just wanted to share, we are trying to work with our GIS team to do far more visualizations. Uh, if anyone heard council last night, OSI is going to be convening an equity task force to help us really define some key concepts that we're working on, uh, make sure we have really authentic engagement and understanding of the challenges we face. And some of that is certainly about, we often think of it as about data. How do we look at information? Like how do we understand these issues? But the data that I would put forward is the data I think about. It's not really uh, likely to be the most important things for people's lived experience. So we wanna work with stakeholders to identify what we should be tracking and understanding in terms of process and output um, to demonstrate really equitable and just outcomes. So I, I say that uh, to let you know, one of the short term things we're trying to do is a much more detailed visualization of energy poverty in our community. So understanding who's paying more than 3% of their household income on energy and then who are severely energy burdened, those paying more than 6%. And we have national data and we've got some granularity, but we're trying to really drill down and get uh, more like neighborhood by neighborhood understanding so we can be more surgical in our support and implementation work. So those are just a few of the things going on at OSI. Um, just wanted to give you a, a spattering. No question. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, Missy, I assume those, um, those uh, grant funded, taxpayer funded EV charges will be metered 
And my question is the energy to power the meters, will that be um, tracked and reported as simply part of uh, rolled into Ann Arbor's overall energy use and emissions profile, or will it be broken out separately in some way? And if so, where and how? That's a good question. And let me, um, I would love to understand kind of what you'd like to see for the data. It'll be metered, so we'll be able to pull. And since it's on a city facility, we look account by account. So it will certainly be wrapped into our footprint for municipal operations, but we also will be able to track exact usage, time of usage, really much more detailed information to try to pair uh, demand with supply for sure. Is that what you're? Well, now that Sumi has, has said that um, our emissions profile now tracks um, fugitive methane uh, outside of the, of the city for the power that comes in. So I'm just trying to figure out how how the emissions profile for the non-renewable energy that will be used to power the EV chargers, how that will be reflected. Um, if it's going to be metered, it, it could be, uh, we, at least we could understand, you know, um, and, and do an analysis, does the EV charger offset the emissions it takes to power? Them? Sure could, sure could. And you may remember, this is unfortunately, it was a, a tragedy of the pandemic, that we were working on a pilot with a company locally to put in, to install two EV charger, chargers that had a solar uh, awning and that had battery storage. So it, it was really a data project. It was not an infrastructure project. We were trying to understand when we're what demand looks like when the sun is shining, how does it pair, how much are we pulling from the battery, when are we pulling for the grid, and that was um, with the pandemic we couldn't get the materials, we couldn't move. Unfortunately. So hopefully, yeah, and, and that's still on our radar, so as soon as we get that loosened up, that project will also come online, which again is a data project which will help inform future installs so we can really understand how we put that infrastructure in place in a smart way. Outstanding, thank you very much. Good. Um, I have a, just a few comments. I should have said this um, right up front. And um, that is um, <clears throat> OSI, um, Missy and Josh um, agreed that Miss, Missy would now be our primary um, energy commission liaison to city staff. Um, Josh is gonna continue to provide a lot of um, behind the scenes administrative support. Um, so in terms of invitations, meeting minutes, things like that, we're still gonna see uh, communication from Josh, but Missy, I think it's your intent to, um, whenever at least you're in town and able to attend our meetings going forward. Um, I had a couple of other comments. Um, I wanted to remind everybody that um, OSI issues a quarterly report. Um, and so if there's something um, that you think maybe was missing in uh, um, the update, um, certainly refer back to that, or then um, you can bring it up in the next meeting or via email with um, either Missy or Josh. I have one question about the EV readiness ordinance. I've seen um, the date of the meetings um, um, that council is going to be taking it up is on the 19th, but that would be a week from today. That's Tuesday. And I think council meetings on the 18th, correct? No, Monday is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Ah, that's why. Okay. Yeah. So it, it is Tuesday. Isn't, it is indeed the 19th. Correct. Okay, yeah. good. Um, and then um, just um, two other points. Um, Missy, would you take a minute and just inform the commission, because I think it was a, an important meeting, um, not only just today, but also the series, um, the meeting that was held today at noon, um, sponsored by the 2030 district and the Washtenaw County um, Contractors Association. There's a whole series of meetings that are going to be held throughout the year, and Missy was a participant and a presenter today. I, I listened in. Um, could you just give a real brief update uh, on that and um, give the people a sense of of how we're trying to make uh, inroads, if you will, into the architectural um, property owner um, and contractor community. Thanks, John. So the Washtenaw Contractors Association, the 20 Ann Arbor 2030 District and AIA Huron Valley have co-organized a uh, year long series, which is focused on implementing A20. Uh, for their membership. It's pretty phenomenal. They're offering credit, of course, um, professional credit for their membership. It is open to everyone. I've registered for many of the events too, and they range from high level to really technical. Um, and it, it, I'll say, I, I think we can circulate the 
the agendas uh, out to folks. Today's was the introduction to A20 and starting uh, to get people thinking about what it means in the commercial and property owner landscape. We've already had some follow up from folks who want to dive more deeply um, into how they can be supporting that, which is uh, pretty extraordinary. We, we had 105 people attend that, that uh, webinar meeting today, so that was well attended. Um, just to, um, one other thing from my side, and then I'll open it up to comments from other commissioners. I just wanted to point out that the A20 plan um, is calls for 10,000 trees to be planted on both um, city property as well as on private property. So um, right now, the city has been planting trees um, on city property, um, and the, the 10,000 tree initiative is is in addition to that, and altogether it's 20,000 trees. So um, it's it's um, significant. So I'd like to open it up to um, comments from others, updates, and um, questions. Commissioner George. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, mine is just very brief. Uh, so Missy, um, I'm very intrigued uh, about the, the 10,000 tree initiative. Um, and I was just wondering if uh, we could have the individual you mentioned as the point person on uh, maybe in March uh, before those po those programs that uh, you mentioned go public, uh, just so that uh, we find out how we can plug into that. Um, because I think that would be um, something that I think really could both raise the visibility of the A20 program, raise the visibility of, you know, the Energy Commission's efforts, um, because people love trees. I love trees. People planting trees is really fun, and you know, especially in the pandemic, is a nice socially distanced activity people could really get into. So, um, uh, yeah, just like uh, if you could have somebody on maybe in March, uh, that would be great. Yeah, I'll have Sean join us, and just to give a sense of timing, the reason it's going to launch in March and April is that's a window when you can plant trees in Michigan and survive. Just so folks know, that's that's what we're shooting for. And then summer is a lull; it's too hot. And then the fall is the next really big push for planting. So I, I don't want you to think we we stole something. Um, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Would February be better then um, if it's going to launch in March? Then do you think to have uh, Sean on? I'm gonna I'll, I'll talk to the the chairs and see what's possible. The other okay. thing we can offer is a special session where anyone who wants to come can okay. come and we can post that too. Cool. Thank you. Um, I, I noted it also in my notes and items for next agenda, and I'm guessing not I'm guessing, I'm certain that the Environmental Commission would be interested in a similar update. Um, maybe we can somehow um, make that a single update. I don't know, that's something we can talk about. Um, for those of you um, that um, might remember, there is a natural features uh, working group in the Environmental Commission um, that's focused on tree and tree preservation. So there's um, interest certainly between both commissions. Um, Commissioner Cleavey. It was just a similar question. I, um, if he's going to come in February, I can ask it then, but if you just give him a heads up, I'm, I'm interested in the question of how the process or the formula to ensure species diversification, how that's being done. I, mean, I know you guys have been mapping trees, but I, there must be some logic to this, and I'm, I have a personal interest in this, so um, just curious how, how they go about doing that. Yeah, I won't do Sean any ser service in telling you about him. He is a trained forester, so he, he's looking at certainly a diversity of species, species that are uh, able to adapt to the climate changes that are coming. And then the other thing you'll notice, um, we have a dearth of fruit bearing trees in our yes. city. And so where can we leverage planting to actually be producing food and healthy, nutritious food as well? So. Um, just a fun bit of trivia, fruit producing trees are female trees. So we have a gender problem in our trees. In the <laughs> so we're gonna work on addressing that. Great. Other commissioners? Yes, Commissioner McCoy. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I'm really excited to hear about the visualization stuff for the energy pod poverty in Ann Arbor. Um, I had two things. One, are you already connected with Dr. Reams on that? Yeah, okay, I figured. Um, and then I also just wanted to say that I do GIS work. So if you need additional support on that, I'm happy um, to help or to help teach people how to do stuff or do stuff myself. Thank you. A, a 30 second comment on that. There's some really interesting GI maps related to natural features that shows um, um, trees um, in that have been, uh, you know, that are in the public right away and their size, it shows wetlands that you can do overlays of all the different uh, photographs, aerial photographs of Ann Arbor going back to 1947, 
up to 2018 with 2020 being planned. Um, so if anybody is interested, um, shoot me an email and I can send you that link. Um, any other commissioners? Yes. Can you repeat where we can find more information about upcoming meetings with the uh, 2030 District 820 Washington County Contractors Association? We'll send a follow up um, or I can multitask and find the website. I apologize as um, as I was speaking, I think I had different login details than the website. So let me let me find it for you and I'll circulate it post meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the question. And thanks, Missy. Anyone else? Yes. Commissioner Zucker. Just a just a quick informational thing I saw from the paper this weekend, the EPA released their report uh, last Wednesday for fuel efficiency. It actually got worse. Uh, it was for the 2019 model year average uh, fuel economy went up or actually went gas mileage went down by 0.2 miles per gallon. I guess it got worse by 0.2 and the emissions rose. So uh, it just kind of stresses the need of rapidly changing to electrification and the infrastructure to, to back it because we're not going to get there kind of on our current trajectory with, with internal combustion vehicles. Yes, Commissioner McCoy. Yeah, just another general update. Um, I know this went out over email, but the President's um, Commission on Carbon Neutrality is accepting comments on their draft re recommendation on, uh, until January 22nd, I believe. Um, and yeah, I just know a lot of people here probably could offer some really insightful comments and expertise. Um, so just encouraging everyone to submit comments. I know Missy and a lot of the other people on the commission and both inside the commission and outside student groups have put a lot of work into that. So it'd be great to have comments. Real briefly on that topic, if you do a search of UMICH, P-C-C-N, um, that'll get you directly to it. And, and in the title page, there's a link to the entire report and a link to the public portal, um, comment portal. It's very easy to use, I've submitted um, comment comments myself. So thanks for that reminder. Anyone else? Yes, Commissioner Levine. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess maybe this is slightly old news at this point, but for viewers or anyone that forgot, um, Congress did pass an extension of the energy tax credit for new solar construction. It'll stay at 26% for the next two years. So that did happen. A lot of other good things in that bill too, which um, we don't need to get into, but uh, if you're interested, definitely uh, check into that. So that was, <laughs> that was big. Anything else? Thanks for all the interesting updates. Um, we're gonna move to the next point on the agenda. We got some interesting things tonight. Um, and first of all, um, postponed from our last meeting, um, we have um, Mr. Hookham that is going to present some slides um, that we hopefully all had a chance to look at. And um, I look forward to um, some interesting conversation on those. And Chuck, I would appreciate upfront you telling us how you would like us to um, save um, or, or ask um, comments. Do you want those during or us to make notes? Um, or do you feel like a lot of the way it's structured is you're gonna answer questions as you get deeper into it? Or do you appreciate uh, comments and questions up, um, dur uh, during the presentation? That's a great question. Um, I'll just say that each slide I could probably talk for 45 minutes to an hour on. I don't think you want me to do that. Um, there's, I think, 18 or 19 slides. So um, there's some critical information I want to bring across in each slide. Some of it's been talked about already, but um, I want to make sure that some points are raised. There are going to be questions on other fronts. Um, if anybody wants to talk about how the grid operates in detail, tonight's not the time to do that. I'd be happy to answer questions in detail later. I, I've got some help with me. Teresa is also an expert. She's on our Energy Commission. And so I think the two of us and others from DT and others could certainly answer questions at verbatim, at nauseum, should they pop up. Um, I think for tonight, my thinking is I'll present some ideas. I'll try not to get into too much um, detail. And I'll certainly 
leave some time for question and answer. I could stay all night like we talked about. And um, as far as the um, next steps go, I think what, what I would recommend we do is kind of go the parking lot route, which is people flagging some general topics. We can, we can have a follow on with Q and A. I can publish something in writing, a lot of ways to handle it. But I think there's a lot of people with interest in this topic that this could take a long time and it's an evening. So I don't want to uh, get into people's personal time. So yeah. that's my thinking and I'll okay, leave it to you, John. Let's uh, let's um, people um, make notes and um, keep those to the end. Um, that way we'll get a sense of where we are. And we have a couple of other important things on our agenda. Um, we want to talk uh, and finalize um, and hopefully vote on a resolution related to energy principles. Um, and we also have um, some proposed um, projects for the Energy Commission to work on. And I don't want people to stay too much after eight o'clock. So let's let's let Chuck get through this and then figure out how we take questions or move on to other topics at the end. Go ahead, Chuck. So Yep, so maybe John to that point one more time is people remember what slide number you have a question on, we'll get back to a slot, maybe question and answer at the end. And maybe I'll just walk through this and hammer through some of the key points and we'll we'll keep moving forward. So Missy, if you could go to the next one, please. Um just while we're getting there, um, so I think I mentioned last time I've been in this in this power business for 40 years. I've been all over the country, all over the world. I've seen different ways of of generating and distributing. I've seen different government interventions. I've seen different ownership structures. I've seen everything from CCAs to munis to um, people, um, communities doing their own thing. Um, it's been an interesting career path. And I, and I can share a lot with you and what works and what doesn't from a pretty unbiased perspective. And I hope to do that as the commission moves forward. Um, and in, in, in effect, I've been in all forms of energy. So as we get into distribution or generation or piping or how things work in homes and, and how do we be more efficient in our use of energy, I think there's a lot of topics that could pop up. But I want to give everybody an overview of its main purposes. What is the natural gas system? What is the electric system? How do they work? Um, they're not simple. They're not they're, they're extremely complex. People don't recognize that. And I think that's part of the dilemma we face is and in, in it'll get into some of these slides, and I think people will tell that this is infrastructure that has been built since the 1900s. You don't change 120 years of construction overnight. There's a press to do that. There's an urgency to do that. We need to be pragmatic about what works and what doesn't. And I think that hopefully is one of the key themes that come out of today is how do we do that? How do we move forward and, and recognize that there are some impacts and how do we address them? And, in a way that makes sense for everybody. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Missy. So this is a summary of how natural gas is, is developed. Um, natural gas is underground, obviously, with, with oil. We refine it, we recover it. It comes out of the ground at a couple hundred pounds pressure. Um, we then have to pressurize it. We have to treat it. We have to remove all the impurities, get it in a pipeline, like I said, compress it distribute it and um, bring it to everybody that needs to use it. So basically you're going from underground, um, could be a mile deep where our wells are at, comes above ground, there's lots of opportunities for it to escape. The industries have done great jobs of reducing the amount of leakage because methane obviously is a, a major producer of greenhouse gas and it's distributed and it goes through a lot of cycles of change. Know that every time you turn your burner on at home, there's likelihood that some of the gas came from Alberta, Canada. And you may think that's not, not credible, but it's true. Great Lakes gas transmission comes from Alberta. I've worked on that system before. So our natural gas that's used in Ann Arbor comes from lots of different sources. There's transmission lines that go across the state, through the state. There's a gas pipeline system that runs through next to line five, Enbridge and Mackinac underneath the straits the large pressure header that comes across from Canada. So the infrastructure is very um, significant. It's been built over time and it serves us um, in a reasonably high reliable format. Um, you don't hear too many people losing natural gas for long. It takes a right compressor station or something like that, a fire or a major issue to get interrupted oftentimes at the wrong times. But natural gas is there and, and that's it's infrastructure in a nutshell. So how it gets to us is is important. Um, next slide, please. So I mentioned in Michigan, we've got our own gas pipeline 
um, systems in the state. We have gas wells in the state. I just um, actually been in the process of, of plugging wells in our system over the last couple of years. And so um, there is infrastructure in place. We have probably less than 15% of the gas in Michigan that's consumed is produced in Michigan. Most of it comes from large distances away. I talked a little bit about pressurization, how it's pressured up um, to distribute it in pipe at long distances efficiently, and then it's stepped down in pressure where it's used. And it goes through a fairly large cycle there. Um, next slide, please. So we have some alternatives. Natural gas's primary use is in heating. We use it for combustion and generating electricity. It's used in plastics manufacturing. It's used in lots of different industries. As far as Ann Arbor goes, its primary use is obviously heating, space heating in particular. Um, it's very inexpensive, obviously, right now. That's the main driver for why people still build it. To Mr. Garvey's point, contractors still think it's the way to go. It's the cheapest thing. Uh, energy equity is sometimes looked at only in the lens of how much people can afford to pay for it. Um, we can alternatively use electricity for generating heat in buildings. We've talked about air source heat pumps at this committee before. Obviously, technology has now got us to a point where electric heating is, cl is close in efficiency and um, can provide enough heat in your house so that you don't need natural gas to support you. Um, and obviously, it takes a technology change to do that. And then there's geothermal. One of the big things in PCCN report from U of M is the idea of getting moving from natural gas to a different form of heating for buildings, which are right now steam heated. We they use natural gas to generate steam. Steam heats the facility. Changing over to a geo exchange process is pretty significant. It's going to cost a lot of money to do that, and that's um, something that's available to all of us. We can all use geothermal, um, but again, you have to factor in lots of different. Uh, conditions, whether it's reasonable at your facility or not. So that's the main point from this slide. If you could go to the next, please. I'm going to switch hats now to electricity. I think we're more focused on electricity and what's going on today. This is a map of what's happening and in the infrastructure that exists in Michigan. So um, we're all situated in DTE service territory for electricity. They're the ones who distribute the electrons to us for our use in our house. The generators are all over the map as far as how many different people generate. Obviously, the city generates, um, the utilities generate, the municipalities generate, um, individual homeowners like Mr. Cleavy generate. So everybody generates electricity. It's dispatched into either a generation to, to, to distribution form in, in a small scale with rooftop solar. Larger generation gets stepped up in transmission level, uh, wired over to substations step down and distributed. So it was primarily a left to right type arrangement where central generation distributed to users. That's changing and more generations being added at the distribution level to the right and piped the other way. And so we're seeing the transition and how electrons move across the system. Um, and so there's many different sources of generation in the state. Um, one important fact that I think people don't know, and I've had a lot of lectures lately, and people still aren't, aren't understanding this, um, utilities, when they generate electricity, um, sell it to MISO. MISO is an independent system operator that, that addresses mostly Midwest um, um, system users' demands um, through generation. So the utilities sell their generation to MISO and then buy the generation back for serving its load or load serving entities. So there's a market transition that takes place with an entity that's not a governmental regulator. It's a market. And then the state is on top of the actual distribution and, and generation side of the equation. So it's a difficult scenario with respect to how much regulation is involved in the industry. It's complicated, there's market factors. And I could talk about this topic for probably a couple of days, but we'll stay there. It's very detailed, very rigorous. Just want to let you know that this is not a simple distribution system to our homes um, or businesses. And next slide, please. This is an important slide. It shows people kind of where things come from. So uh, Michigan net electricity generation by source in 2020. So look at how much is carbon-based. There's petroleum, natural gas, uh, coal So 
you see a substantial amount of coal fire gas fire generation in the state. You see a lot of nuclear, and you see some big, big topics here coming down the pike because Palisades is over 800 megawatts, Fermi's over 1200 megawatts. Those are large nuclear sources that are going to come offline in, in not too distant future. And then you look at the bottom with hydroelectric and non non hydro renewables, which are wind and solar. We've got to build a substantial amount of, not, of renewable generation if we ever intend to displace nuclear and fossil fuel sources. And that can't happen overnight. It's something we have to work quickly on. And I'll show you a slide in a minute that talks to that. But we've got a lot of infrastructure that exists that we have to change pathway on, and it's not an overnight process. Um, so this is purely electricity. Um, another important fact is down to the bottom. Um, Currently, the Michigan Lower Peninsula consumes or has a requirement of 2,500 or 25,000 megawatts of, of online um, reliable um, generation that has to exist to support a load across all of our seasons, peaking and non-peaking seasons. And we're limited in how much we could actually import from other places to about 3,200 megawatts. That's the um, 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 current the capacity import limit. So. If there were generation from other states that were more renewable, we're currently pretty capped at how much we could actually, quote unquote, wire into the state to meet its demand. Next slide, please. This deals with electricity and, and transportation. Um, you can see that all of a sudden we've got some other fuels in there that are mostly transportation fuels. Again, look at the Look at the magnitude of carbon-based sources currently used in Michigan across all um, sectors in 2018, and how much is non-fossil-based. Um, we've got a tremendous amount of biomass in the state, but a lot of those plants are gonna retire. And we've got Palisades and Fermi retiring. We've got a pretty big gap now. When all those retire in our carbon, if we're trying to get rid of carbon, a pretty substantial hole to overcome, we're going to make that happen. That's the main point of this slide. Next slide, please. Um, I don't want to talk too much about this one, um, other than we all know AC and DC. Um, let's just skip this slide for the time being. If people have questions on this, we can talk later. Um, Missy, I think there might have been a slide that was skipped. Uh, help with that. Hmm. Um, I'm sorry, go forward, please. Um, no, I'll go backward one more. I have a slide that's missing from this, and I'll, and I'll talk through it. I'm not sure why it didn't pop up, but um, I mentioned MISO. MISO controls the large generation that's put in place um, across its service territory. Again, think about Midwest. And Michigan Lower Peninsula is known as Zone 7. Um, it keeps track of statistics. So in like 2005, 76% uh, of our power uh, was coal, 7% gas, hardly any renewables. 2020, 33% coal, 35% um, gas, and all of a sudden we have 12% wind. And then if you look at what people are trying to build today, you'll find complete switch. And we talked a little bit about this transition stuff that has to take place. All the applications to build generation in zone seven, virtually all of them are storage, or wind or solar. Very little natural gas has been proposed to be built on a large scale. That's an important transition and it needed to happen. It's a, it's a case of how fast can we build it. And that's an important topic to keep in mind as we move forward. Any generation we build in the state has got to be transmitted to the loads, so like to a city or to a building or to a facility, to a, to a industry. So where we build it becomes a challenge. And so I can speak directly on this point because I'm involved in this daily, is people do not want large scale generation built in the state. Um, we get fought almost all the time on communities for wind. Um, solar has become a little bit of a challenge as well at large scale. Um, it's just gonna become a challenge of how do we build renewables in Michigan if we truly need to use their, their generate in Michigan and distribute to our needs, how do we do that? I think one of the points that Teresa and others have raised is how critical megawatts are or energy conservation, how we have to stop utilizing energy if we ever 
hope to meet um, our needs with renewables because we simply can't build enough to generate to get to this level. And I'm going to illustrate that in the next few slides. So here's the next slide, which is important. This is for Lansing Board of Water and Light. The city of Lansing is about the same size as, as Ann Arbor. Um, they have their own electric utility that also uh, produces water for the facility. The key takeaway on this slide is this is a graph of their load, their electric load. In the summer is the red line, um, winters is um, the blue line. And if you run down there, you see at the bottom is by hour. So hour one is obviously 12 in the morning to one o'clock in the morning, um, so forth. So in the middle part of the day, in the summer, you see the big peak. If you look at December 3rd, the other day in December of, of last year, in the wintertime curve, they had about 340 megawatts of connected load. That's how much power has to be generated to support their load at any one point in time during that day. It's a pretty flat day of demand. Um, there's got to be quite a bit of power online. And um, I'll show you in a second how they generate, what they use to generate that electricity. It's important to recognize that um, that is important to have enough generation that's flexible to meet the load. Um, and I'll explain that on the next slide, please. So I'm trying to correlate here what happened on December 3rd, and I'm going to show you some wind. We've got wind in the region. Um, we also have solar in Lansing. And what happens is you see at 12 in the morning, we have a little bit of wind or wind turbine that's rated at two and a half megawatts, made to one megawatt. We didn't have that much wind. It drops off um, and then it rises up during the day. And in that evening window, we have a fair amount of generation that's available from that one specific wind turbine. If you look at solar, you see a shape of a curve where the solar generation ramps up when the sun comes up and it ramps down when the sun, go, sun goes down. The main takeaway here is every time you see the solar drop dramatically on that curve, it's not flat. There's a cloud that goes by or a bank of clouds go by. We lose generation very quickly. So 10 megawatts that's generating in this case at five megawatts because it's winter time, all of a sudden drops off in a fairly substantial pattern. So if you can think about that 340 megawatts that they had on a demand basis on the previous slide, going through the cycle of what happens when a cloud goes over, um, we've got a tremendous impact that happens when those things go, go down. We've got um, um, frequency issues, voltage issues on the power lines that bring power to the user, and they have to stay within a pretty tight dead band. And when this type of an event happens, when a cloud flies over, the more you have that solar, the more impact you're going to have on everybody's generation. So for us to deliver electricity that's 99.9% .9 reliable, you've got to have other forms of generation online when these events take place. And that's a critical line of thinking because you can see the wind curve looks pretty flat. In reality, the wind is kind of a flat curve. It doesn't change as dramatically as solar does, but it still doesn't necessarily meet the demand when you need it on the time basis that you're there. So I just wanted to let you know that, you know, you see this daily winter peak demand. By the time peak hits in Lansing on a cold day, it's late in the day. We don't have any, hardly any solar. We fortunately had some wind. The only way they could make it up was have natural gas or some other form of generation, or else they simply aren't going to have enough power for, for the um, user. So it's an important topic that I could speak on for a long time. I'm trying to present this in a tight, short fashion, but you know, very informational, and it's really difficult for us to provide that power. Next slide, please. So I'll just get into the goals and look in down at the bottom here on, on utilities load serving entities. We're all forced to, we're, we're, it's not forced, we are, it's part of our human nature as a utility to be affordable. So it's important that people that pay for the service get such at an affordable price. We have to provide reliability and resilience. Electricity, as we electrify, it's going to become even more critical that it's reliable. And it's aging right now, so we have to overcome some of the aging factors. Um, uh, it's number three on the list here as far as minimizing environmental impact. It's probably top of mind, more like item one now. Everybody's thinking as far as what's most important to us is moving away from fossil fuels, but it's something that's part of the equation. Um, we have to maintain um, uh, economic development and business. We can't forget that. And we have requirements due to MISO and requirements to, to generate and buy and sell on a daily 
and look ahead basis. So there's a lot of things at play when we talk about how is generation moved along to the customer. So it's a difficult equation. And this is done every day by every entity in Michigan that's a load serving entity as to how do they meet the load of their customer um, looking at all these different dynamic factors. Next slide, please. This is a little snapshot of Ann Arbor and how we're bounded, just some infrastructure that exists. I wanted to let everybody know that uh, both electric and gas inf information, whether it's uh, where things are located, how big it is, how old it is, how, how reliable is it, is all what's called CEII or, or confidential information, critical energy and electric infrastructure information. And it's not available anymore. Um, up till 9-11, some of it was available. Now it's pretty much all off, the, off limits to people unless you're part of the equation of delivering. So um, you can get snapshots of information. And I wanted to let you know that this is kind of a snapshot. Some of the takeaways on this are there are infrastructure improvements being made. You can see in red some recent additions by DTE working with ITC to bring more power into the infrastructure of Ann Arbor so that it's more reliable. But on the green side of things is generation. So if you look at how much generation is in Ann Arbor, um, if you added up everything on the list there that's generation, you're probably going to get to about three megawatts of electricity that's generated. Go back a few slides when we talked about demand, and we're talking about during a cold day in winter of, of Ann Arbor, we're probably over 300 megawatts. So right now, we're three megawatts. We need 300. We're pretty far short. So if we start thinking about changing gears and becoming our own individual entity, we've got a larger load to serve than that's anywhere close to what we're able to generate today. So very difficult for us to, to change from what we're doing now to a different model, perhaps, in how we generate and deliver electricity to our, our citizens. Just an important slide to take away. Also know that the infrastructure that's there, the additions and distribution have been done to enhance what's, what was there before. Our system in Ann Arbor is pretty reliable, but even myself, I, I lose power three or four times a year. It becomes very impactful to myself as far as my business goes. Um, it impacts every citizen in Ann Arbor. So we need to keep focused on maintaining a higher degree of reliability to the extent we can. Um, next slide, please. I'm not gonna get into the details here. I'll save some time for a committee meeting, but um, this is a nutshell of how power comes to you. It's from substations. Everything's double-ended today. We've gotten to the point where there's very reliable distribution um, coming from utility to the consumer. We're seeing in the middle consumer line more distributed energy going backwards into the system. The more backwards distributed energy we see, the more difficult it is to maintain the, the reliability of our infrastructure because of the impacts that has on voltage and frequency. I'm doing it today. We have our microgrid working in Jackson. We are experimenting and trying to find out how far we can go with certain distributed energy uh, additions to the grid. Um, it's a real-time activity going on at the utility level, and uh, we're hopeful that more distributed energy makes sense, um, and I can talk more about that topic, and we can do a field trip at some point, but uh, that's all I wanted to say on that topic for tonight. Um, next slide. That's a microgrid, and what a microgrid looks like, we've talked about that in the past, so I'll just skip that for the time being. Um, other than to say this is pretty much um, what what our microgrid looks like in Jackson, aside from we don't have this diesel generator gas fire generation. A lot of microgrids do, ours does not. Next slide, please. And just to wrap up, um, you know, there's a lot of complication out there in industry. Um, there's a slide that I didn't put in the slide deck that talks about a study that just came out of MIT in Massachusetts that talks about what is the infrastructure going to look like going forward? How do we need to solve the problems we have? And I talked a lot about Michigan's um, system, the challenges there. The solution that came out of MIT was we need to build more transmission so that we can import more electricity so that we can take wind that's blowing in Iowa and bring it to the Michigan and, and serve our load here potentially and, and come up with a better mix of how distribution works um, to our customers. So. Um, wires could be a, a, a more eloquent solution, although a lot of people don't like to see them built in terms of solving this dilemma of more renewables being delivered to the customer. Uh, we won't do this poll, but 
think about when you go through the list, all the things that are out there that are in terms of, of importance. What is the most important to the city? What's the most important to us as an energy commission? Um, thinking about um, energy and how do we avoid um, continued greenhouse gas emissions. And I'll just stop for that. Thank you, Commissioner Hookham. I'd like to open things up for comments and questions. Commissioner Cleavy. On slide 11, Chuck, I don't know if you can get back yep. to that where you can see it. Yep. Um, but on that slide, so I, I assume the solar you're talking about there is the centralized solar owned by Lansing Board of Water and Light. And that's what that's, that's reflecting. Um, so my question to you is this, if, if that solar were decentralized solar on individual houses that were net metered, some with batteries, some charging their electric vehicles, um, and some without batteries, would the problem be basically the same or would it be better? So the good thing about batteries are they smooth the curve. So some of those peaks that you see coming up and down when, when clouds go over can be solved through using uh, fast acting batteries. The more you aggregate rooftop solar together with and it could be centralized solar plus rooftop solar, the better off you are if that power is smooth and we're not seeing these these sudden changes. You can see in, in scale, this is a couple of megawatts a minute. Yeah. It's not the time right. switch is dramatic. Now, if you said that 340 megawatts mark were to be met with well, 100% you said solar. You get 10, 10, 10 megawatts of solar there. So the question is, if that was not centralized, it was 10 megawatts, but it was decentralized, would it have the same kind of negative impact given the fact that you know, none of this is none of this power at 10 megawatts goes through a battery none of it's used on site to power um city owned city vehicles or city anything i mean it's plugged into the grid so it's the the impact of that um cloud is substantial and radical it's like a it's like a bomb going off in a power plant um but my sense is given you asked the question about ann arbor Ann Arbor doesn't work, not a municipal utility, and we don't have the luxury of being able to, to deal with this kind of a problem. Um, so if we wanted to put in 10 megawatts or more, um, decentralized is our, is our best option with maybe, you know, a, maybe a half a megawatt of our community solar here and there, but, you know, we're gonna do a, multiple smaller systems um, and they'll be more resilient because we'll be using that power as I say, to charge on-site vehicles, we'll probably be doing some batteries, and we'll when the cloud goes over, it isn't going to go over all over the whole one one array at a time. It's going to be inter intermittent. So it seems to me that this slide, while it's it's interesting um, for a municipal utility that has a big chunk of solar, Ann Arbor would is better off if we did decentralized solar. It wouldn't have the same negative impact on DTE as this does on consumers energy and Lansing border water and light. Is that, is that correct? So, so it's scale factor driven Mark. It, it's good to have more distribution because more circuits are, are less affected by change. The yep. challenge is what are the circuit loads and how is load distributed? It gets a little more complicated than just centrally versus decentrally located solar. But okay. I, will, I will say that in general, if we could smooth out the generation across a series of circuits, you're probably in a better state than if everything is hinged on one circuit, seeing a significant uh, generation point. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I can't see everybody, so just unmute and ask your question. That way we can see, continue to see the slides. I, I have a question. Uh, clearly, Chuck, the picture that you paint here is clearly bleak. We all know that this is very hard. This is why we should have started 10 years ago, but unfortunately, we're pushing the utility to move in that direction when they're not leading in that direction. The utilities are not going and being aggressive at helping solve this problem. If they were, I think we'd all think they're much better of them, but that's not what's happened. In fact, if, I, if you go back in the last 10 years, they pretty consistently have resisted anything pushing them towards renewable energy. So what's going to change? Number one is we have to make a choice between free market and monopoly. And we have to make a change. Is it gonna be centralized like it is now, or is it gonna be decentralized? 
And these are hard questions, of course, but they require policy yeah. and they require the utilities to actually have incentives to get to our 2030 goals, not the incentives that they have now. That's what I'm guessing. The incentives are all wrong at the executive level in the utility. I hear you. I, I think that there are some policy issues that have to be addressed if we if we are going to switch in a dramatic format. You're you're correct in saying we should have started 20, 10 years ago. Probably we should have started 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, we were still looking at building more coal plants in Michigan. I was looking at that myself. Um, we didn't have this degree of concern, and, and the immediacy of the problem is part of our concern. The other side of it is how this infrastructure is paid for. And one could say, well, utilities should just switch over everything to renewables. Well, there's some technical concerns about doing it, but um, it's the infrastructure that we built that's paid for over time. Um, these investments that are made, um, let's look at DT's 1.2 big, uh, gigawatt gas plant. That's a 35 year investment that takes that long to pay for it. So if you want stepwise change, you gotta do it quickly, but you have to do it smartly in terms of finance. And you can't simply you know, take infrastructure that's still being paid for and say, we, we're, we're gonna stop paying for it. Somebody had to pay for that and it's ratepayers and it's owners of the stock. And it, it's, a, it's a financial model that can't be, it has to be addressed in, in a couple different formats. And I, I think for simplicity, I'll just stop. But, it's not easy. I, I, I hear exact all your arguments. I think that billion dollar plus uh, natural gas plant we just um, I've got approved within the last year and a half. I think a lot of people think it was unnecessary. A lot of people thought if the if the mon monopoly utilities had thought about this differently, they could have come up with a different solution that wouldn't tie us into 35 year payback for something that's going to be obsolete possibly within five to 10 years and it's killing our environment. We can't keep making these kinds of decisions. We can't. And yet they do. This is the problem. They have to change their mindset. So how, how do you do that when you're running with a monopoly? I wish I could run a monopoly where I didn't have to answer to my to anything. I wish I could do that. But that's not the real world. We don't live in a world where everybody gets the benefit of a monopoly. We need free markets. Clearly, if we're going to find a solution to this, we need a free market to implement distributed solutions. I think we're going to talk about that, Mr. Chair, in a, in a short amount of time here when we start thinking about alternatives. Um, if, if, if we want to think about that from a city perspective, if a, if a community choice aggregation or municipality is of mindset to make a change, if that is the solution to Larry's post problem, there are some challenges with that. One of them is the legacy costs that I mentioned. Um, who's going to pay for all the infrastructure that got built? Um, it, it, if it's going to get knocked down because we don't want to use it anymore, it's not, uh, it, it's not a zero cost. So we have to think through those tough topics when we get into stepwise change. And I think there's policy and finance and other aspects of this question that have to be all addressed together. Anyone else? I can see you also, or just unmute your microphone. Um, Chuck, I want to make a comment on um, natural gas. I think it was your second slide. We don't necessarily have to see it. Um, and I had some email communication with Commissioner Cleavy on this. And um, Mark, if I'm wrong, or somebody else, if I'm wrong, correct me. Um, my recollection is that the EPA has doubled and doubled again its estimate of um, methane leakage. The current estimate is roughly 2.3%. Um, the range of estimates is something like one and a half up to 3.1%, um, you know, with some certain confidence levels on that. And um, my recollection is that at a leakage rate of 3.2%, natural gas becomes as dirty as coal. So um, obviously, um, the fact that estimates have been going up um, are, are not very comforting. Um, I know that a lot of um, larger gas and oil producers have done a lot, but we also know that there's been a lot of deregulation in that area from um, the Trump administration. So um, 
leakage of natural gas and then using it for generation is, is indeed a big issue. I know it's um, figured into um, the inventory that the city does. Um, and um, there's details on that um, um, that's available through OSI. It's also taken into consideration in the PCCN um, draft recommendations and in their calculations. But obviously, um, natural gas um, and leakage, methane leakage, <clears throat> is, uh, is certainly top of mind for many people in looking at these decisions, um, including all the things um, that uh, Larry talked about. And Larry mentioned that he had to leave um, now, um, so th that's why you saw him drop out. Um, but uh, I'd like to just um, then open it up to anybody others that might have some comments or questions. Well, let me just say something there, John, Yeah. if I could real quick. And that is, if you think about methane, think about what are the bad actors here. We all talk about CO2 because it is probably the most voluminous as far as greenhouse gas. But if we go back 20 years again, 30 years, we're looking at hydrofluorocarbons in our air conditioning units and things like that. These are 22,000 times worse than CO2, and we made stepwise change. It took policy, and it took economics and other things to say, stop using those products. They're going to harm the environment. Yep. So we're making those changes. It's in, and in the case of methane, it's methane hydrates and other things you're seeing in Siberia. Those are major issues that have to be stopped, mm -hmm. way more so important than CO2, perhaps. Yeah. And I think Larry's, Larry would say, no. We, we know what we need to do, we just need to do it a hell of a lot faster. Yeah, from the policy space on electrification, um, if you want to start to convert homes, or if as we shut down natural gas storage fields, um, and we would have to redo natural gas infrastructure in a certain location, how is it that we can work together on policies or creation of new customer programs that could help utilities or help customers to convert their appliances to electric appliances so that they don't convert to propane, as an example, that they would convert to electricity so that we can start to kind of isolate those problems to the generation sector and start to remove natural gas. So there will be a series of um, storage shutdowns, if you will, of different storage fields. And so I think we also need to look at those incentives or helps for customers that we can partner together to take chunks of customers at a time. And instead of building gas distribution infrastructure to them or redoing that gas distribution infrastructure, we invest in electrification infrastructure versus that. So that's a kind of a policy issue or an incentive issue um, that we can continue to champion. And, and look at, at this electrification and getting weaning ourselves off of natural gas or reusing that natural gas infrastructure for hydrogen. Um, and so part of those stimulus packages and stimulus bills are also extending credits for compressed air energy storage, carbon capture and sequestration. So if we do have to have a gas plant for 35 years, we should be looking at carbon capture and sequestration and the natural geology in Michigan on how to get it out of the air or keep it from going into the air in the first place. So there's other investments that we can continue to, to make. It's just, as we always talk about, it's the speed. And the MISO that we talked about, it's taking like two years to get a study done to get new transmission built. And so we're also working to advocate to reduce that study period to increase the time, increase the pace. Mark, I see that you want to weigh in too here. Yeah, I just, um, I, I gotta, I, I'm trying to form an analogy between the total quality management movement and, and what, what you're describing that um, for years, um, you know, until we started tracking, until Deming came in and we started tracking and understanding the, how materials uh, flow happen um, in the manufacturing process, we, we weren't aware of where big pollution was happening, waste was happening, which in effect was pollution. And by mapping that supply chain and then reorienting that supply chain um, and reducing the waste and reducing the waste, we reduce the pollution, et cetera. And I think the same thing uh, I'm seeing, I'm seeing, I'm just curious about what you think, um, that, that other utilities and, and gas, natural gas suppliers now 
They're using blockchain chain technologies to track the flow of electrons from the gas well to, to the point of usage. And the benefit of that is the forced discipline of seeing where, where leakage occurs. Um, I think we're going to see from the Biden administration the, the demand that we use current technologies, space-based uh, satellites to track methane leakage, et cetera. I mean, this is not rocket science to do this. So, uh, you know, if we stop wasting this resource, um, it's not the burning, it's not me burning my natural gas in my oven to is creating this problem. It's the leakage, this the fugitive methane leakage, which, which I, I believe using blockchain technologies and other things could be solved to the benefit of everybody, including the utility. What I don't see from a policy point of view is that the MPESC is not incentivizing the utilities nor punishing the utilities for not doing this in Michigan. So I'm curious, do, one, do you think that there is the possibility of major savings and pollution reduction in frac gas by tightening up the, you know, reducing the emissions from the wellhead to the usage. Um, and second of all, are there policy issues that this body should take that would tell the city, hey, let's get behind this with DTE and consumers energy. What can we do as Ann Arbor to put the pressure on the Public Service Commission to make it in your, you know, your worth it to you to do this? So two questions. Do you that there are technology fixes that could be applied that would solve significant part of this problem like blockchain? And if yes, is there something we can do to help that, help you if we tell the city to do something, including having Ann Arbor adopt, tell DTE, we don't want any gas that comes in here for any watt or any gas at all that doesn't have a blockchain tied to it. It seems to me that even if we failed at that, it would be an interesting fight. <laughs> I, I think that what we continue to do is collaborate as an energy commission and the things that Ann Arbor has already done that Missy's talked about, like intervene in cases. You intervene in voluntary green pricing cases, you intervene in electric rate cases, and we continue to work with our representatives um, to bring policy options to the state. We, have, we can write resolutions and we can, uh, for different policies. I believe that we should, everyone should use the technologies that are available at our disposal to measure what we can. The um, infrastructure investment programs that are going on to replace what utilities call vintage services is a short term effect and that helps with fugitive emissions. So looking at how and where and how fast we're investing. Um, but it does always come down to how much capital and and where do we invest the capital, the way the rates are structured currently in order to keep rates affordable for everyone, right? Missy talked earlier about pivoting into low, low income areas and stuff and how do we do that? Um, so I, I think you know, Mark, you and I can continue to work offline with the um, other commissioners and stuff and try to find those particular policy issues um, from a natural gas perspective. But you can also, I mean, we can use drones for forestry programs that can tell us what kind of trees are growing by the cameras that we use. So I know that we can identify natural gas leaks and other things. So there's lots of different technologies out there that we can investigate. But it being 7.30, Mark, let's you and I take this offline. Cool? Cool, thank you. <laughs> and, and I got a lot to share on the technology front too, Mark. The other point you raised is on the regulation side of things in MPSC. As you know, personally, they're pretty short staffed. Think about what happened in the mid-Michigan dam collapse that happened and what's happening as a result of that. I mean, clearly a case where there weren't enough regulators involved in the, in the equation of people looking the other way. Um, we, have, we have thousands of oil and gas wells in Michigan alone. How do you think those are going to get regulated? That's not an easy solution. And you add all the pipeline valves and everything else, the leakage points, it's not a, it's not a simple problem. But technologies like GIS and, and drones do exist to help. So more on that later. So thanks for, OK. Um, one, we'll take one last question from Commissioner Zucker, and then we'll move on to the next topic. Just a quick question. So you know, we're kind of hamstrung a little bit by policies of the, the MISO network. 
but within there, uh, of all the states in the MISO network, are there certain states that we could be benchmarking as kind of the leaders of, of renewable energy within this overall system that we're, we're kind of stuck with? I think Teresa, yeah, I, I, I think if you look at the states in MISO, you'll, you'll find that Michigan is pretty advanced in terms of renewables. Minnesota is probably a little bit ahead in terms of certain policy changes that have happened. Illinois has got some different policies, but they're not necessarily all of a MISO state. So those are the more advanced states. Some of the other ones, mostly down south, are still significantly more carbon intensity in terms of their fuels. Yeah, we benchmark, like you said, to Minnesota, but we also then really should need to look out and look at the coasts, right? Because the coasts usually go faster than the Midwest. And so where you guys have been looking for ordinances and lots of looks to California, Massachusetts, the New York Rev, those are other places. Uh, Wisconsin Energy is a good one and Excel Energy is also a good one um, within the Midwest footprint. Okay. Um, with respect to everyone's time, uh, let's um, go ahead and move on to the next subject. Um, I encourage um, all of you to contact Commissioner Hookham and Commissioner Hatcher if you have specific questions and if you think um, at the end of that they're of interest um, for the group as a whole, we can put that on the agenda of another meeting. And as was mentioned, um, we have some things coming up um, in plan for future meetings where we can talk about that at the end of the meeting that I think um, will keep this dialogue going. So um, the next um, is um, an energy principles resolution presentation. And um, Missy, I'm going to turn things over to you for that. Sure, I, I didn't prepare a formal presentation, although I do have slides that I'm happy to share that we shared with council last night. Uh, this is revisiting the conversation that we had in December around energy. At that time, we were just calling them energy principles. But I just wanted to first and foremost say thank you. Thank you for the feedback you gave at the meeting. Thank you for the feedback that I got in emails for many of you. I know I had some sidebar conversations with a number of commissioners to really understand kind of the issues that were being raised and addressed. So I just wanted to uh, highlight some of the changes that were made between when you first saw the principles to where we are today. Um, first, we have uh, reframed them. So there are three core criteria and then five principles. And the core criteria are things that are sort of the rocks of the, the work. And those are additionality, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and equity and justice. And then the principles um, are, we've added, uh, I'm sorry, we've had uh, affordability in, that came from this commission as well. Uh, so we had four and that sort of elevated. And those are things that we wanna maximize to the fullest extent possible, but we do see scenarios where there'll be conflict with some of those principles, either with themselves or possibly with the core criteria. So core criteria have to be centered um, and then the principles maximized to the extent possible. Um, other things to elevate that changed is we were thinking about um, the description of equity has evolved quite a lot. We talked quite a bit as a commission around, um, I would, this is my summarizing, so forgive me if this isn't as eloquent, um, procedural and distributive justice. I heard you talk quite a lot about, and so we brought that language explicitly into the description. And then there was quite a, a lot of discussion and really rich discussion around um, making sure people are properly compensated throughout the system for the work that they do. And we have a responsible contractor policy that council passed. And so I took a lot of your feedback and tried to align it with the way we're approaching contracting overall so that we acknowledge we want obviously good, fair labor practices integrated into the work that we're doing. Missy, I, I have a quick question. Um, are there, did you say there are now four criteria? No, there, there, are, um, there are three criteria and five oh. principles. And five. And you talked about affordability. Where is um, the... I have a printout in front of me. Of Let the me one here. I, I will share my screen because I think I have this open. For you, I just have to find the right one here. Cost effective, I, I see. It that. is cost effective. Okay, it's, that's what you mean, not affordability. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. and so that wasn't in last time. Okay. That was mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. See my screen. I'll try to. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that what was uh, attached in Legistar was indeed the, 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 the most recent version. 
Okay. Absolutely. And we did talk to city council last night in a work session um, about these criteria and principles. The discussion was really great and uh, we got some clarity and I, th I think also some I would say broad support to, to keep going like you're on you're on the right track here with these um, use your expertise use the energy commission as well uh, not necessarily in terms of like redo the principles but when you apply them you know working with the commission then to evaluate options as you're bringing them forward to say here's why we're coming with let's say a virtual power reduction agreement or a virtual power storage agreement or why we're coming with uh, a new build in our community and a PPA program. You know, all of this, don't worry if I just throw out acronyms that don't feel comfortable. Uh, the co-chairs and I are talking about kind of a series where we're gonna explore these with the commission. So what we heard from council was this sort of feel, this feels, this feels good, like you're touching on the topics we care about, um, do it, right? Like they're excited to see what comes and so are we. Um, most of our discussion actually did focus on the second principle about what is local, right? So uh, that's an important question because in some places local can be up to 250 miles away or local can be within the county. And so we really wanted to understand kind of how people conceptualize that. And while it wasn't broadly consistent, I would say I walked away saying Michigan. Like I hear Michigan, I, I hear that um, as being important and also making sure we look in our own backyard too, like the green belt, like rooftop solar, like landfill solar, like making sure we check local boxes. So Lizzie, all of that is a way, I'm sorry. Lizzie, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is, um, if there's time tonight, I'll let you judge that. I would be interested to pose the question that you did to, have you posed the question to the commission about local and get some feedback from this group as well. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, and I will certainly do that. The only other thing I wanted to add is we were asked to do, and we have been thinking about this, a, a way we'll evaluate. You, you all mentioned this too. How will we evaluate these criteria? Uh, and the answer is we have a prioritization framework. Most of the things in that prioritization framework touch on these principles um, and these criteria. There are a few like location that isn't in there. So we'll have to add that in, but we're going to stay true to the prioritization framework and do sort of a plus where we need to add specificity in. So we'll be running, um, we're going to run a test once we land on what the final criteria and principles are. Um, we'll be doing a test of running two or three different energy options through and see how they score out. Missy, I have a question. Can you explain sort of the difference between criteria and principles? I still don't really grasp that. Our criteria more sort of musts and principles are sort of wants yes. where we say we're not going to do something unless they meet these musts yes. um, and then when we then go from there and look at various alternatives um, then we're going to evaluate those based on these principles and um, essentially say okay we want to do each one of these but we realize that um, some of these are potentially going to be in conflict with each other if we do something fast it may be not not quite as cost effective. Is that a good way of understanding these? Yeah, that's absolutely right. That's okay. absolutely right. So I would expect any, for example, resolution that we brought to council would explicitly call out how it aligns with the criteria mm -hmm. and then would highlight what principles we met and why others were a challenge and not possible in this particular offering. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm just going to oh, ask. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is Mike, I was, I was just going to ask, um, are you anticipating using these as sort of scoring criteria for projects at some point? Or, you know, I'm thinking back to the original climate action plan and sort of, you know, took probably a, actually a mixture of criteria and principles and used them to score different projects in theory to look at where we were going to put um, resources into. Are, are you thinking of it in that operational framework or is it is it more conceptual than that? It's, it's both. It's an outstanding question. Um, Thank you for asking it, Commissioner Schreiberg, that I see this across that spectrum. So we're, you know, we've been working on our energy strategy and uh, candidly, we have a virtual power purchase agreement as something we're thinking about. And I have to write an RFP if that moves forward and I need to know what I'm asking our developers to think about. What are the core things that we're going to expect to see that are then going to be ranked and graded in response? To that? That's very concrete. But also, if this comes back, it may tell me a virtual power production uh, or power purchase agreement isn't the right thing. 
It also will inform what we invest in. It might be more local generation that we invest in. So it's allowing us to make strategic decisions at a high level and then implement those decisions with contractors because we were able to, to very explicitly say, when you build for us, we define local in this way, we're looking for local builds. I think we had a question from Commissioner Levy, was it too? Mark? Uh, it's sort of just sort of an observation, Missy. This reminds me of the good old days when we used to talk about good, fast, cheap, pick two. Um, because my sense is that this is going to come down to that a lot. Um, so I would encourage you to, um, you know, let this group help you deal with that because I think we're going to be mostly forced into the position of picking two when we start moving on this. Um, and that we've done most of the easy stuff already. <laughs> so this is going to get yeah. more interesting as we move forward. So uh, great stuff. I, and I love, John, the way you, you, you have positioned this because it's, it's, it's right. You know, reducing green gas emissions, start late, local. Yes, it's scalable. Well, that's going to be a real problem. You know? But yes, good stuff. Um, you also reminded me of one other thing that I think is very important. We did lead pretty heavy with new builds. We changed the language in here to be explicit that this is both about efficiency and renewable energy generation. And so uh, we will also prioritize energy efficiency projects in this way. And so one of the things we raised last night is as if we're thinking about equity and justice, maybe if we did a power reduction program, we focus on doing work in Highland Park or Corktown first. Right. And uh, when we do it local, who goes first too? So all of this helps inform the data we collect and how we partner and get those reductions in the system. I think I saw Commissioner McCoy wanted to say something. Yes, go ahead, Amber. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could explain the new cost effective principle a little more. I guess just because when I hear cost effective, I don't necessarily like assume affordability, but I don't know if I'm just reading it the wrong way. And so I was wondering if when you say like find solutions that are affordable as possible, do you mean like for the city or for rate payers, or is it assumed that what's cost effective for the city is also affordable for the rate payers? Um, so I was wondering if you could explain the Excellent. Yeah, excellent, excellent question. Um, it is both, to your point. Uh, for example, we'll be using these principles when we make decisions for municipal operation purchasing. So in that case, we'll be looking at the ROI. Um, you know, that's not just the upfront cost. That's also the cost to maintain that infrastructure, uh, the long-term uh, factoring in a cost of carbon into those calculations, which is something we're starting to you know, try to do at the city as well. Um, that's pretty nascent, candidly, but we're exploring it. So certainly for city operations, but that's really our, our kind of ledger, which is still taxpayer dollars. And then also when we're thinking about community solutions, um, how are those solutions being paid for? And what's the impact that they have on people's budgets? You know, can we do things that are to the extent neutral. Um, there are some solutions that will be fairly neutral. There are some solutions that will have a small premium. And there are some things we could do that are really, really cool that will be quite expensive. And so we just we just want to have space to really talk about that and figure out the pros and the cons. Um, so this is just, it is not the deciding factor in terms of what we recommend. Now it may be a deciding factor in what our elected body chooses to move forward with. But it, you know, it's, it's a reality, and so we want to be able to to factor scoring in to our decision making. Thank you. Other questions or comments? I'm scanning through. Um, I have one brief one um, related to um, this concept of starting local, and I think it also ties into equity and justice. Um, you can leave it there, Missy. Um, so one thing um, that I'm wondering is um, in terms of um, grounded in equity and justice, if there should be any thought to being restorative um, and, and not just um, something where we're um, sustainable and where we're doing it with equity and justice, but we also look at where have people suffered historically from climate injustices. And I think that as a bearing on what you do locally or not. Um, and indeed, you know, some of the people that um, have and will be suffering the most 
from climate injustice, if you will, um, are definitely not in Ann Arbor. Um, and certainly many of them are um, close to locations that have been um, where power has been generated or where, for example, there's a lot of um, um, diesel truck traffic and things like that. But some of them are even farther away from um, from home. And I'm wondering if um, this idea of starting local and then um, as we go out from there, if that's potentially in conflict with um, the idea of restorative justice, which we really haven't captured here. I think that's a really good good point, John. Um, the way I would respond right now is you, you very eloquently framed the three core criteria as being musts, and equity and justice is a must. Local is a, I'd like to have in that framing, mm -hmm. and so we would have to reconcile uh, that those points. Yeah, I guess my main point is, and I, there was an email exchange on this topic that I had where I got some pushback from some people on the environmental commission, um, and saying that you know potentially we may go farther farther from home in order to to look at something um, that is um, potentially compensating for and, and grounded in equity and justice and from particularly from a, um, a restorative justice um, perspective and I, I know some people very feel very very strongly we need to be looking um, within essentially eyesight if you will or you know an hour's travel of Ann Arbor so to speak um, and there's other people that say, well, maybe we need to be thinking um, and loosening up a little bit on the local side. So I, I think that that tension is maybe was what um, council member Briggs was talking about when she was talking about this, this, this issue of what, what, how important is local and how do we judge local and, and in, what, uh, in what context or with what viewpoint. I don't know that we change anything, but um, it's just something to think about. Um, what I'd like to do is um, draw this into a point uh, to a close if no one has um, any additional uh, really significant comments. And that is we have a resolution um, and um, that is attached to the document and is in Legistar. Um, and what I would hope um, that we can do is, um, I, I, I guess we had a first reading because we did consider this and um, we, I don't think the resolution has changed. So what I'd like to do is put it up for a vote tonight so that we can at least as a commission draw this to a close. That doesn't prevent Missy and council from um, listening um, to what we've discussed tonight and making some additional tweaks or um, opening their ears to maybe other voices uh, before these are finally adopted. And you know, none of this is actually cast in concrete for decades either. So. Um, if we could, I would like to get um, a motion to uh, approve um, or yeah, the or to approve the or consider, I guess I should say, um, the resolution. And after that, maybe a second. So I see Mark. No move. Second. Second um, from Robert. Um, any discussion? Has everybody read the resolution? So. What I'd like to do then, um, not seeing any comment, is um, take a vote. So um, all of those in favor of approving the resolution um, as it is written, um, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 All those opposed? So I see it's, uh, we, I, is it a, Julian, do you oppose the, uh, the resolution? I abstain, John. Okay, you abstain, John. Okay. Julian, I, I, I saw your hand up go late. I don't know if there was a delay. I approve. You approve. Okay. 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 Good. So we have um, one abstention, and um, everyone else um, that's um, present approved the resolution. It therefore passes. So. Thank you very much for everyone's comments on that. Um, the next topic on the agenda is draft criteria and principles for achieving renewable energy goals. And I think Missy, you're gonna present that as well, right? We just did that. Okay, we did that together. They're separate, it's two separate points, I guess. Um, so the next point then is um, there are five proposals um, of work that um, 
Energy Commission and or commissioners can work on, and those were included on Legistar. And Missy, I'm wondering if um, you could bring those up. Um, we don't have a resolution or anything, but um, um, I think it would be great to cover these briefly. Um, this is sort of the meat of the rest of the meeting. Um, so I think we have a few minutes to do this. Um, and I might just add that, um, you know, in, in the wake of some of the, the meetings that we had um, after meetings resumed um, sort of um, late summer, early fall, um, with the action item tracker, there was a lot of discussion about um, what the commission could work on. And there was some, also some sideline um, discussions between um, Carlene and me and Missy and OSI staff. And um, so there are some things that are still going. Um, and some of them overlap with this, but these are proposals from OSI on projects um, where OSI sees um, an opportunity for um, the commission and or commissioners. And that's outlined here in terms of like um, number of commissioners and stuff um, that's, that we'll see further down. Um, but Missy, you wanna take the lead on these and maybe, um, so maybe maybe we try to do the same thing here for um, expediency sake as you go through all five people okay. make notes um, and then we come back to those and ask questions um, and um, hopefully get the answers then and um, then move on from there and turn or maybe open things up for discussion on, on how we go from there um, so why don't you take it away Missy Great, thanks, thanks, John. Uh, so, staff, as Commissioner Mursky or Chair Mursky mentioned, uh, stepped back and said, "Where do we really want help? How can we be super uh, productive with the commission? Use your expertise and your time as wisely as possible, and get really demonstrable progress on core areas in A20." And so, we came up with five ideas of things that we are actively working on where we would love assistance should commissioners be interested. Um, all of these are with other partners too, but we laser focused on the ask for the commission here. So if this, any of these are of interest to you, there will be other stakeholders who will join this work. And I can talk about that in a separate space. Um, if you're interested in these, we can, we would like you to help us, you know, also recruit other people into the conversation. So the five ideas, everything is framed the exact same way. Um, a very quick purpose. Um, how many commissioners that we're hoping to work with, and again, plus other folks, what's the time frame for the commitment? So is it a whole year? Is it a two month? Like this is a rapid kind of thing we need to move on. Um, this particular one is going to take six and more months. Um, what are the desired outcomes or outputs that we're hoping to achieve together and any other considerations to put forward. So the first is the beginning of our beneficial electrification strategy. I'm sure some of you already have thoughts on this. Uh, you'll notice we identify range. Uh, we're starting with range electrification. I am happy to take all of your feedback on this. I will say we landed on this with the Rocky Mountain Institute um, based on a whole bunch of their guidance and feedback and some work we've been doing. We can get wins fast. This is on the market. Um, there are things to do. We also want to launch a sticker campaign uh, that will go on uh, water heaters and furnaces that helps get people prepared to electrify since those are things that tend to go fast and you need to move fast. So how do we get them to build a strategy to make those kinds of transitions? So here we're looking for up to three commissioners uh, to join us in this campaign. We've got, to, we've got to work through a lot of things. You'll see here this is six plus months. Um, we are going to need to do some background research. We've started compiling information, but what would a range replacement campaign look like? How are we going to work with the box stores? How are we engaging with the contractors? Uh, who are we going to start for targeting? Who are we going to reach? What are key messages? Uh, so you've got behavioral science pretty heavy in here, as well as some um, general research around effective uh, programs. The, I just want to frame this here. Um, we chose stovetops again because of work with RMI and also because of the public health impacts of ranges. Um, you are combusting on site and air quality is tragic in many, many homes because we're not properly venting. And so this is not just a greenhouse gas strategy. This is also a public health and safety uh, decision to move forward in this, in this way. So that's one. The second, we already have um, a group that's working on this, but we do want to kind of open it back up. The electric vehicle strategy, uh, hopefully the ordinance moves, but we have to not only develop and refine the full strategy, we need help prioritizing the actions that are in there to help build the sequence of what comes first and how. 
Um, and I think the subcommittee is already working with Simi on this, but we do want to open it up from folks and we put a, a hard timeline. We actually want this done um, as soon as we initiate it within three months. So this is a little more intense of an ask um, and is a really big ask, but is also a really, really exciting ask because the ecosystem around EVs is, is really uh, charging up. So that feels great. Uh, the next one is our energy concierge. This is also an A20. There has been some really great historical work, in particular looking at Boulder and the program that they have. But here, we really, really need to start making some decisions um, about how this program is going to be operated. Um, these are going to be hard decisions to really think through. Is this something a government should do? Is this something a nonprofit in our community should do? Does that nonprofit exist? Do we need to support standing up something else? How is something like that maintained? Um, potentially, if we have a structure in place, how are we feeding information in? Uh, so there's a, a lot here as well. This is an important ask. Uh, we have two commissioners, and I think I'm happy to blow that one out of the water and say we could take all of you if you wanted it. This is so important, um, but this is so important that it's a big ask for folks, and we really want this resolved uh, by the beginning of quarter three. So we're, we're basically what? five months um, from now. So this isn't a small ask, but we know this is really important for our A20 goals to have some infrastructure in place. So we'd like to really understand uh, what makes the most sense and then figure out how to operationalize that. Um, and again, we have a lot of baseline uh, research, really good research to build on. This is one that um, I'm leading, which I'm super stoked about. Uh, I think we need to do an energy education uh, series. And this is a year long initiative. I've already reached out to the state uh, to ask if they'd partner with us on, on uh, or partner with us on this. The idea here is um, taking up to four energy commissioners and uh, some of you as commissioners and possibly a handful of you in your professional space uh, to build a series of uh, educational curriculum from an energy 101 uh, to, I would say what Chuck was giving us was more of like a 301, um, but how do we kind of build the series so people understand how our grid works, um, what opportunities there are available to them. It's kind of uh, at your own pace. You could go through this virtual series, but I would love to work with folks to develop the curriculum uh, and to actually administer it, to identify our speakers, to do recordings of them. And it needs to work certainly in Ann Arbor, but throughout the region. Um, and I would argue throughout the state because the system um, is, is relative, I mean, there's nuance. And so we can have specialized modules, but this is something that if we did with the state would have to be something that was capable of being shared. Um, GLREA would be a phenomenal partner, but we need to have not just industry, not just advocates and candidly, not all white males um, talking about this. We need to diversify the voices. We need to make sure that this is trusted, um, you know, so people see themselves in this space and really can uh, have confidence in the information that's being delivered. So I'm really excited about this. Um, and I've been through a number of really intense boot camps around energy infrastructure. And I just want to bring that to the public because this landscape is complex and we're going to be doing a lot of very complicated things in it. And then the uh, last one is a low to moderate income solar working group. So we have certainly been working with partners that many of you, if this like triggers something in your mind, um, chances are we're working with partners that you're thinking about. Uh, we've been talking about this with some stakeholders for a while. How are we really growing in our area, in the county, and especially in the city? How are we providing more and more opportunities for low to moderate income folks to access renewable energy, um, not just for the greenhouse gas benefits, but for the monetary benefits that can also come from that technology? Um, so we have some options we've been exploring, like rental programs, panel reuse, because most panels, panels still have a useful life um, once they're, they're retired. So how do we keep them uh, in the system? How do we do panel recycling? How do we fund this? Um, there's, a, there's a whole bunch that's here, and I'll, I'll name like Rob Rapson is someone that we're thinking and working with. Um, he's already agreed to join us in this work group. So we're looking for two commissioners who can dedicate some pretty serious time intensely actually over the next three months, um, because we hope to have something we can pitch in a three month period. And then the following three months, you see three to six would be more around engagement uh, with stakeholders. So those are just five very concrete ideas of things that we're working on where we would love to have the expertise of the Energy Commission to help us craft these programs, work through the nuance, and get ready to launch something. 
I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I'd like to open things up for questions or comments. And you're, again, I can't see all of you, so just unmute your microphone. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Missy. John, on the EV strategy, it should be EV and alternate fuel strategy, because we're going to see hydrogen fuel cells popping up really quickly here that are going to be important and changing. Um, Commissioner Becumber, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah. I was wondering, um, uh, it seems like you want to move some of these pretty quickly, but what's the time frame on getting back to you on this? And then very concrete question. So did you say that this document is on Legislar Star? Mm -hmm. I yeah, can't. that's where I accessed it from Legislar. I don't know why, but I'm not seeing it here. Um, if you link, if okay, yeah, you don't see it as a separate document. It's linked in the agenda. I, I had that same problem this afternoon. Oh, so go to the agenda, yeah, and then click on the link, and then you'll find the documents that we've been talking about. Yeah, I had the same problem initially. Sorry about that. Okay. I don't know, Missy or Josh, if he's still listening in. Um, I think some people just go to um, details and then they click and they look for all the documents and some of the documents were not available that way they were only available via link in the in the agenda you know, I'll share we that. Do it both ways yeah I'll share I'll share that feedback right. I think Thank you. Right at this point um, in terms of time frame one we don't anticipate anyone who's had a chance to read these we also finish them Friday afternoon so it, I would say if we could maybe take two weeks we'll send a reminder out and if we could have folks kind of pick um maybe rank order their top one or two that they want to engage with um that way then we can distribute amongst folks there also is no expectation that everyone wants to be on one of these you may not have the time the interest the capacity so please don't feel obligated but we did want to put the call out so i i don't want you to be shamed into raising your hand so I, I would ask for, for those that are interested, I'll get to you in a second, um, Council Member Briggs, that you send an email to um, Missy and Josh and copy also Carlene and me. That way we're all in the loop and that way someone doesn't also get missed. Um, Commissioner, I mean, Council Member Briggs. Yeah, I was just um, hoping that you might be able to expand a little bit on what you meant by the Energy Concierge sort of program. Yeah, this one is an A20 and it is a kind of one stop shop for residents, businesses to be able, um, I sometimes call it the bat phone. Like, how do you pick up the bat phone and get on the line with someone who can help you understand what opportunities are out there? So, your uh, your home isn't comfortable right now. Like I am freezing. I will tell you the truth. I have wool socks on. I'm sitting in a blanket. I have no heater in my office. Help me. Uh, can I call the concierge and they'll tell me, you should really think about air sailing. Like here's a rebate program and they'll help you kind of navigate that. Or if you want to go solar, they can help tell you about Michigan saves and the financing. So someone that can kind of bring you in and help you through the really complicated energy world. Um, and I don't know, uh, actually, John, I'll kick it to you if you want to add anything, because you've thought a lot about this, too. Yeah, I mean, think of uh, you know, a hotel concierge, you know, um, you you get an energy audit done and the energy audit says you can do a whole handful of things or maybe some some rough ranking um, and you just don't know where to go. I mean, what what, what do I do first and um, who are, you know, who are contractors, um, um, where are those contractors uh, certified and by good groups? Um, so it's someone that you can go to that doesn't necessarily have um, a financial in, d incentive in, in the answer that they give you. Um, that's basically what we're looking at. And, and frankly, this is really important because it enables many, many strategies and actions in the plan. Um, you have to remember most of us um, are lay people um, when it comes to the one or the other subject related to energy. I, I just want to throw in one other thing. Um, Missy talked about diversity. We've got um, two youth commissioners and, you know, we'd, we'd be great if you'd be willing to do work on some of these things. Um, you know, some several people signed up for um, what we had in the action item tracker was um, things related to um, public engagement and education. Here's an opportunity. So um, we're not looking for a show of hands here tonight, but uh, keep that in mind when you look at these opportunities. 
Arlene. If, um, if any of us are interested in, if not participating in a group, because we don't have time because we have, we're participating in another group, will there be um, access to like what's status, what's going on with each particular project and um, an opportunity for, for those of us to just pr provide ideas or resources or references? Yeah, I anticipate we'll be giving monthly updates on how this work is progressing and opportunities for feedback and co development. And then if products come out of the groups, you uh, forgive me, I know I'm not sharing my screen, but some of them have very concrete products, others have more like marketing kind of materials, uh, really concrete products I anticipate we would bring to the Commission for discussion before we went to Council then to launch something new. Do these become subcommittees, John? Well, they're, they're, each one of these is effectively an ad hoc uh, working group, um, as Missy indicated, with commissioners and other people from the community. If you look at these topics, it shouldn't be just commissioners that are represented in, in these groups. So strictly speaking, they're not, uh, as I understand it, Missy, um, working groups of the Energy Commission. They are more um, ad hoc teams that are working on these topics with commissioners um, being a part of that that uh, collaborative effort. Does that sound right? Yeah. I, I think that's right to start. I think we may discover that some of them become formal committees as they their work kind of grows and evolves. Uh, this is really a an opportunity and almost kind of a, a request leveraging the expertise that you all hold as commissioners and based on some previous conversations of how do we really leverage that expertise and the unique advantage that you have to keep building and moving the work forward. So it's it's sort of tan, it, it's related. It's kind of tangential, though. Um, sorry, I'm losing my words. I think one one thing that it, thinking about the past conversation and thinking of speed. This is one of the things that we're trying to do here is drive with speed and not have an energy commission working group that meets once a month for the next 18 months to come up with something. But as Missy said, in several of these cases, how can we really pull together a group that's going to work intensively on this so we have an output in three months, six months, whatever the case may be. Okay, so um, we all have our homework. Look at the list and send your names in if you're willing and able. Um, if that's it, then I'd like to move to committee updates. And I don't know, actually, we're going to have to maybe think. Um, by the way, Carlene uh, and I, along with Missy and Josh, um, are meeting uh, about 10 days before every meeting and working on agendas. And so we will work to continue to try to uh, keep the agendas focused and also string topics together that are related. Um, this next section, I think we're going to have to figure out um, whether or not we go through each one of these groups because I'm not sure each one of these working groups, quote unquote, as such is, is um, functioning, but we'll go through the list. Is there anybody from the renewables group um, that has anything to report on? Is that group meeting? Silence is golden in this case. We'll move on to the next topic, building in the built environment. Anything going on there right now? Community outreach. Transportation electrification. Carlene, you want to give us a brief update? I think we talked about a lot of things, but. I am simply going to reiterate what uh, Missy already included in her report at the beginning of our meeting that in uh, one week, one week from tonight, the um, City Council will have the opportunity to hear arguments, um, you know, from the community in favor of um, and any other arguments with regards to the electric vehicle readiness ordinance. Any of you who are interested in participating in the public hearing it is open to anyone. There are no restrictions on number of people who can participate. You all have uh, three minutes each. Um, it's like the um, the introductory uh, public public input and in, that we have for our meetings at the beginning at the end of our meetings. And um, it's this is a really important. There's been a lot of work, a lot of thorough thorough work that's gone into this ordinance. Um, it's it's uh, it's something that is but really 
significant f result that we can deliver. And um, I hope that all of you, if you don't have the opportunity to participate live, you can always send um, an email to city council and they do read emails. So that's my update for tonight. Thank you. Um, so the last is a report from the Environmental Commission. Very briefly, it was a, a working session. Um, so they just reviewed um, the different working groups, their purposes and structures, their accomplishments. We've talked about 2021 goals. And um, we reviewed a draft of an annual report that is going to be going to City Council and the bylaws of the Environmental Commission. There's a requirement for an annual report that we don't have. Maybe something to think about um, at some point in time or whether we do that jointly, for example, with OSI um, on the A20 plan. Um, so that closes out all of um, those reports, those committee updates. And I'd like to then open things up again for public input. And while um, everyone is um, getting ready to do that, that might want to, I'll just read this again. This is an opportunity for people to speak for up to three minutes. Um, if you're on CTN, you need to call 888-788-0099 or 877-853-5247. Enter the meeting ID 913-5783-4502. Um, this information is also on the agenda in the video feed. Um, staff will select callers that have raised their hands one by one using the last three digits of your phone number. And to raise your hand, please press star nine on your phone and you're gonna hear an automated announcement. Um, when speaking, um, please state your name and address at the beginning of your comments. Missy, do we have anybody yet? Not yet. Okay. I'm just going to keep on going just to keep the evening short. So if we get someone, you let me know. Um, the next point on the agenda is items for the next agenda. And I'm just gonna mention a couple of things um, that are already in the queue, some from tonight and some from earlier. So first of all, um, we've agreed that um, on the agenda next meeting, there's going to be a presentation from a local group um, called Ann Arbor Public Power. It's a group that is um, advocating um, that um, Ann Arbor consider municipalization, a municipal utility. Um, and um, they've indicated that the presentation um, is gonna be roughly 20 minutes, but I anticipate some interesting Q&A and discussion after that. Um, and so um, I'd like to also mention, we talked about the state energy code and the status on that and um, the ban on natural gas. Maybe that's something that we can look at. These are things that we'll discuss as I mentioned um, when we set the agenda and then maybe an update on the 10,000 trees. So I want to make sure that you realize we captured all those. What did we miss? What else would you like to have discussed? I guess the meeting is getting longer than everybody wants it to be. So um, what, uh, Missy, did we get any phone calls now? Okay. I, I would just assume that there would be an update on uh, moving forward with the um, the, the strategies, the pro proposed strategies that we're looking at. Yes, commissioner, commissioner input maybe on on those five projects. Is that what you're talking about? Okay, good. Yes. And Chair Murphy, one other thing, just to kind of add from the staff perspective, is. We uh, we talked about having kind of an, an edu energy educational series that we have one presentation that would go through what we're thinking about in the energy strategy. So what is a virtual power purchase agreement? What is municipalization? What is CCA? And so exactly. I think we yep. can answer that. Yeah, thank you, Missy. There's some, um, a, a contact that I have that's um, very well versed um, in um, utilities and utility regulation. And I'm trying to get that individual to make a presentation um, we've talked about the possibility of potentially in, in this series, so to speak, that Missy talked about that we might get um, DTE to present. Um, so obviously there's a lot of um, overlapping issues in this whole space of um, how we um, procure 
um, our energy. Um, and so there's a possibility of a whole series um, that I think uh, would be helpful to educate us in the community and council. Okay, are we ready for adjournment? Okay, so um, thank you very much um, everyone tonight for your time and um, we look forward to some great meetings. Uh, it's now um, 8.18 and uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah.